so uh, looking at a few more Proverbs tonight, uh, I believe there's six more that we're looking for, looking at. Uh, the first one is Proverbs 15.22. It says, Plans fail when there is no counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. Plans fail when there is no counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. And there's a lot of different ways we can, we can kind of apply this to our life. The first one is if you're going through a life choice, be it uh, marriage, who should I marry, career, should I go to a career change, what career should I take, those kinds of things. Um, if you're going to move, any of that kind of stuff, it's always best to ask wise people who will give you honest answers. So that's kind of twofold. First off, ask wise people. People who have actually done it, people who have succeeded in doing it. You don't want to ask somebody who's living in the streets, hey, how do you afford a house payment? They obviously don't know, right? So you want to ask somebody who's been there, done that, okay? Somebody who has experience, you wouldn't want to ask a kid, like somebody in their 20s. You don't want to ask somebody in their 50s, 60s, so on and so forth, right? Makes sense. Somebody who has life experience, someone who's a little bit wiser than us young guys. You don't want to look for someone who's on the same tier as you. Look at someone who's achieved more than you, is at a higher tier than you. If you have, uh, if you're about to have kids, look for somebody who already has kids. If you have teen kids, look for somebody who's a grandparent. See what I mean? Go get up for your for your uh, and for your uh, wisdom, and then also make sure that there are people who will give you honest answers. There's a lot of people out there that'll just kind of give you half truths or maybe lie to keep the peace. People won't really tell you the truth. People who don't really like you, and so they'll just say something just to hurt your feelings. So make sure that you're asking the right people. Um, if you have a task to do, be it pastoring or running a ministry or parenting or leading or marriage, anything, get advice and input. You don't have to do this thing on your own. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have it all figured out. That's just ego. You don't have to have all that. Um, I don't know of any top-tier leaders who are not getting some sort of mentorship or, you know, something going on there nobody nobody rules the world and does it all with themselves like nobody does that no it may look like oh he just knows everything no he just read a lot or he just has a lot of people who he listens to so on and so forth um <clears throat> okay and uh, so get advice and input learn and be willing to learn there's three things you got to do with learning the first one is learn something you don't know you learn it the second thing is you unlearn there's some things that you have learned that is wrong and you have to be willing to unlearn those things because you will keep yourself at that level. It's like when you're in sports. Sometimes you, you know, pick up a bad habit. You have to get kind of a, a coach to, to help you get out of that bad habit. If you're, if you're doing uh, writing or something in school, you have people check your work and you learn how to unlearn how, what you did. And then the third part of learning is relearning. So hope you guys uh, keep that in mind. Have a plan. For, if you have a plan for, for investing or financial freedom or whatever, and you should, you should have a financial plan for your future. But if you are starting to have one, you don't have one before, you're trying to get one now, get input and counsel from others. Ask people, ask others, and, uh, and learn. Once again, try to find somebody who's not under crippling debt. If you have a bunch of credit card debt and you're trying to get out of credit card debt, ask somebody who is out of credit card debt. Don't ask somebody who's still in credit card debt. Make sense? You want somebody who's actually has done it. Um, okay, so uh, be careful with, with all this being said. Th there's something that I always have to say. Um, which hopefully you've been thinking about as I've been talking. Be very careful what private business that you have becomes someone else's business. Okay, it's not always a good idea for everybody to know what's going on with you. Makes sense. <laughs> and uh, people don't always have your best interests in, at heart. And uh, well, there's just a lot that could be said there. But it, when all things has been considered, maybe keep really private details to maybe just a few, two or three, and that's okay. You can know 500 people, but maybe just two or three. Um, okay, uh, and then lastly, have a group of people in your life that are mentors specifically and exclusively. They are mentors or counselors to you. They are people who are honest, and that's what they are for you. They are not your kids. They are not your spouse. They're not your work friends. This is what they are. They are people in your life who are your counselors and mentors. And then have a different group of people that are your friends because your mentors can't be afraid that they're going to lose your friendship by telling you the truth. Okay, does that make sense? You need friends to, ha to, have, to, you know, to hang out with, but you need mentors that will help you grow and become better. Make sense? So, okay. Next thing, uh, Proverbs 15.33. The fear of the Lord is what wisdom teaches, and humility comes before honor. The fear of the Lord is what wisdom teaches, and humility comes before honor. So these are kind of two different thoughts, so we'll take them like that, one at a time. Fear of the Lord, what does that mean? Well, there's two aspects to the fear of the Lord. The first one is more of a physical fear. 
Uh, it's a fear based on the realization of who God is and what he can do. Fear that he's going to retaliate against you. The, the realization of just how big God is and how little you are. And that is a physical fear. You see it repeatedly throughout the Bible where even when it was just the pre- not, not necessarily the manifestation of God, but just like the nearness of God or, or even of his angels kind of, you know, cause people to kind of, you know, hide their faces and stuff. So there is a physical fear element that goes with it. But that's not all it is. There's also another aspect of the fear of the Lord, which I could say like this. Living by God's standards is living by the fear of the Lord. So basically, you answer to somebody subconsciously with everything that you do, right? So either you live in fear of yourself, where you're trying to appease yourself. You live in fear of, um, you know, punishment from the government, where you, that's, that's the deciding factor. Of everything. Somewhere, you're going to live under the fear of something. And living under the fear of the Lord is where you are submitting yourself to God's standards rather than another person's or so on and so forth. So uh, you will either live for yourself and not be afraid of those consequences, or you will obey God, and who you live your life for is who you fear. Who are you living your life for? That's who you fear. That's as simple as I can make it. Um, So living as though God were real and cares how you live, that's living under the fear of the Lord. Um, if you are living to answer to God for your lifestyle, you know that you are going to give an answer for the things that you say and the things that you do. That's living under the fear of the Lord. So um, the fear of the Lord answers these questions. Why shouldn't I? Um, why does it matter? Uh, and then another question, uh, who will know? I could do this nobody would know. The fear of the Lord answers those questions. So uh, and nowadays, for instance, we hear a lot of... Um, a lot of people say statements like love is love. Well, that's true if I'm not living under the fear of the Lord. But if I am living under the fear of the Lord, then I know that to God, love is not love. That's not how it works. So, I mean, there is a standard that, that God has for life and love and how we express sex and all those different things. And uh, so to live under some delusion that God doesn't care when he said in his word that he does care, that would be not living under the fear of the Lord. Now it's just being difficult. Okay. We're good. Uh, Oh, boy, you're going to outsmart my dumbness. Look at that. I thought of that first. I communicated to it telepathically, and Ray just picked up the waves. There's an alien out there somewhere in outer space that has also received the transmission. He will be here in a little bit to move the chair. I'll let him know when he gets here. He's too late. (laughs) Uh, So, okay. Um, Wisdom teaches us to fear God. So it says the fear of the Lord is what wisdom teaches. True wisdom teaches us to fear the Lord, teaches us to live by God's standards. Because what could be more wise than living outside of the temporary? Right? If I'm only living for my life here and I've gotten an eternity afterwards that's coming, it's not really wise to only be concerned about the temporary, is it? I mean, we're all fading So wisdom teaches us to fear God. It teaches us that truth is not what we decide it to be. Wisdom teaches us that truth isn't just whatever we decide it to be. There is objective reality to the world. Uh, And also that that we understand consequences eternal and temporal. I just explained that. Uh, And also wisdom kind of teaches us that we will have to answer to God and we'll have to answer for what we do. So, um, and we have to answer, I already said that, we have to answer to God for what we do. So we live wisely. Okay, yeah, I said that. So if you want to be recognized in life, anything, um, you want your boss to recognize you, you want your pastor to recognize you, you want your whoever, your spouse to recognize you, here's the thing. Be humble and learn and grow. That's how you get recognition, real recognition. You have to be able to take the correction that people give you. If, if, If somebody can correct you and you can learn from it and, like, humble yourself, you're going to go far. But if you always have to be the sole source of wisdom in your life, you have to be the only one who has the answers. You can't listen to anybody else. You can't listen when, when, when you did something wrong and somebody calls you on it. You, you can't ever say, yeah, I was wrong. You, you can't do that. You will never go far in life. First off, people don't really like being around arrogant people. Um, there's actually a lot of slang words <laughs> that they have specifically for these types of people. Um, and uh, it's one of those things. So humility comes before honor. Uh, God, the Bible says that God rejects the proud person, but he listens to the humble. Imagine that. 
Your prayer, what does it take for you to be heard from God? Well, I have to say the right words now. I have to do good enough Monday through Friday so that when I pray on Saturday, he'll actually hear me. No, none of that stuff. Uh, you know, I have to know exactly what his will is. No, I have to be humble. That, that's, that's what causes us not to be rejected by God is when we're humble. But when we go to God like, oh, I have all the answers. You're so lucky to have me, God, because I've been faithful when everybody else left you. I've been the good one. Well, that's really not the way to get God's attention on really anything. So the third proverb here, 1625, there is a way that seems right to a person, but his end is the way to death. This one really hits on because there's a lot of people, there's, in our culture as a whole, there's this idea you have to discover yourself, be true to yourself, you know, uh, search inside for the answers, and, and you know, um, uh, don't let people change who you really are, and all this different stuff like that. But when you look at proverbs like this, it's drastically different than the messages constantly assaulting us from everywhere in, in media and everything. There is a way that seems right to a person. I think that I know my way. I think that I'm smart enough. And it's wrong. Its end leads only to destruction. So how do you know if something is the right cho choice if it's God's will for your life? How do you know that? For some people, they say, oh, I have a feeling inside. So, but sh feelings change. Feelings change very frequently. If you've been married, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, I love her. We can never be apart. And then a couple of years later, you're like, Ugh. and then you get over it and, you know, you grow and whatnot. But there's this part in your marriage where the honeymoon phase definitely ends. You know what I'm talking about? It definitely does end. When you're young and, 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 and stupid, they say love is blind. And that's true. That's very true. You overlook all the bad traits. And there's this movie called, I think it's called something like 500 days of summer or nights of summer days of summer something like that anyways it's about this guy that gets with this girl and at the beginning of the movie he's all i love her crooked smile and i love her laugh but then at the end of the movie he goes i hate that crooked smile and that obnoxious laugh well that that's kind of the way that i mean honeymoon phases always wear off like when you get a new pastor everybody loves them they're great oh my gosh he's the best pastor we've ever had he is he's everything i just i'm learning and i have so much and then what happens over time like he starts to irritate you. The same stories, you hear them over and over, and you're like, I've heard this before. I'm not growing. I'm just not growing anymore. See what I mean? And, and so it kind of becomes one of those things. So feelings do change. Well, what, what, what? You can either follow your own arrow, live your truth, do what seems right to you, or you can do what the Bible shows to be wise, and you can follow advice from other people. Read the Bible, listen to other people. That is almost always going to answer any problem that you have in life. What should I do in this situation? Well, what does the Bible say? Well, the Bible doesn't talk about the situation. Yeah, it does. You just aren't paying attention because you're not applying it to that situation. See what I mean? So then what we do is we moralize. We take a verse out of context where it says, like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then we're like, I'm going to take out this massive loan that I can't afford because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's like, hold on. <laughs> not what that verse is talking about. You look in Proverbs, it talks about not taking out loans. So I'm pretty sure you shouldn't take that one out of context. And that's kind of what I'm talking about. It's one of those things where you can follow your own error. You can be totally convinced in your own heart that something is true and right and good and be wrong. You can be completely convinced that it's okay to cheat on your spouse. You can be completely convinced that this is the right job for you. If I had that job, I'd be happy. You can be completely convinced that if I move to this place, then I'll be happy. It can happen. You can convince yourself of anything. And you can be so sure about it. So sure about it that, that nobody's going to tell you anything different. That, that absolutely can happen. It happens all the time to people. Every day I talk to people who are doing this. I think people are getting hot, Damien. Uh, every day people are doing this. But that doesn't mean that it's right. Just because you're convinced in your mind that it's right doesn't mean that it's right. You know what I mean? I'll give you another example. When you're dealing with your kids, sometimes you lose wisdom. Oh, well, you know, it's my kid. How can I turn my back on my kid? So you do something that you think is helping, but it just makes it harder for them because now you're kind of retarding their growth where they're not able to mature to that level. You know what I mean? There's a point when your kids should branch off from you. They should figure out how to be financially responsible. They should figure out how to make amends with their spouse rather than always dragging you into it. That should be something that your kids helpfully do. Um, so you can be completely convinced of something and still be wrong. The, you see people do this with, with this. This is the one. This isn't a Disney movie. Life is not a Disney movie. There is no one, okay? There's people that you will get along with and people that you won't. And then you choose to love and love and, and stay faithful to them to the end of your life. And that's 
how it works. And then you can quit deciding to be faithful to them and get, either get a divorce or cheat on them. I mean, that's, that's your choice. It's not something that drove you to it. It's like, oh, God predestined me to cheat on my spouse. No, he didn't. He had nothing to do with this. Um, so, you know, this is the one. No, no, no. There is absolutely nothing in the Bible that should make us, make us convinced that there is the one. Um, oh, well, that's where I should go. Here's the thing. I've noticed that God more calls people to a thing than he does to a place. And what I mean by that is this. When God called Paul in the book of Acts, shining light, falls off the horse, he goes blind. So he has to go blind into the city and he's healed. And he just kind of hangs out in the city there for a number of years. And then uh, God says, hey, I've called Paul and Silas to go out into the ministry. So lay your hands on them, pray for them, they're going to go. And they go. Where, where does God tell them to go? He doesn't. He doesn't tell them where to go. They just go out and start talking to people, people about Jesus. There's only one situation where God intervenes. He says, I think I'm going to go to this, this place over here that I haven't been yet. And God says, no, don't go there. Go this way instead. That's the only time. All the other times, he just said, yeah, I've called you, so go. See, what we want is we want one golden brick road that will lead us to Oz. And if we just find that, that one golden path, like on Dune, if you guys have ever read Dune, the golden way, you know. And the thing is, the thing is, most of the times God, God gives you multiple things that you could do. Like, for instance, Ray, you do the food pantry, right? God has not predestined you to do the food pantry. You have chosen to do the food pantry. And there's other ministries you could do instead, too. See what I mean? God did not, like, from the moment of his birth, say, you have to do this one. What the Bible actually says is it says that he is... Um, uh, uh, called us and predestined us to do good works. So if you find a good work that you can do, by all means, do it. God never told me to adopt my two children. He never said, do this. There were kids who needed adopting, and I had the ability, so I adopted. So, I mean, it wasn't rocket science. I didn't need a shining light from above to tell me what I knew was right. Make sense? The Bible says it. Other people were saying it. I, I, I knew in my own heart. I knew what was right. I know what the Bible says about, about orphans. I know what it says about it. I don't need to pray some lengthy prayer about it. So, uh, so we can say a lot of things about our motives when we're having this kind of talk, talking about, you know, a way that seems right. And we could talk about the evilness of our heart and all that stuff. But here's the thing that I want you to get. It's a journey. Keep seeking God today and following the instructions of the Bible and your feet won't slip. It is, I'm convinced it's impossible if you're seeking God to accidentally go the wrong way. Okay? Seek God. Do what, you, do what you think is right. And if it's not right, he'll intervene if you're seeking him. And it, otherwise, he'll come to you directly and tell you specifically do this thing. See what I mean? And uh, so if God hasn't told you specifically do this thing, because if he does and, and you don't do it, that's a disobedience. But if he has not told you and you're just doing something you feel is a good thing, like helping out at the food pantry, uh, and he hasn't told you, Ray, stop helping out at the food pantry. Then by all means, go ahead and keep doing it. I mean, it's not immoral to help in the food pantry, right? It's a good thing. It's a good work, right? See what I mean? So, uh, and obviously we have that idea in us, um, I don't need God. I've got it under control. Well, you know. Another thing we do is we kind of stress ourselves out. I have to get a good job for, for my life to have any purpose. I have to live, to live in the right place. I, uh, here's the thing. If you do mess up, check it out. God will guide you to where you're supposed to go. Hmm, I messed up. Maybe this wasn't the right choice. Okay, well, let's learn and do better. I think it was Maya Angelou that, that once said, uh, do the best you know to do, and then when you know better, do better. It's a very, I think when I, when I read that, it was super profound for me, but it's a super simple concept. And uh, anyways, so 1628 says, a contrary person spreads conflict, and a gossip se separates close friends. You know, I haven't heard somebody call, called contrary since I talked to a grandma. My granny that is now dead, she's the last person I heard call somebody contrary. So, yeah, weird. Anyways, be careful of the people that you listen to. Be very careful of the people that you associate with and be very careful about the people that you believe. Just because somebody says it doesn't mean that it's true. Well, there's got to be a point where we say, mm, nope, I'm going to do a little bit more thinking than that. I'm just not going to just 
blindly believe something just because you said it. Um, so there's people that are going to be people who spread conflict. Make sure you're not one of them. And remember that when you get around those people, you become one of them. And a gossip separates close friends. So let's ask a couple questions. First off, what effect do you have on others? When you are around others, what effect do you have on them? Do you help them to feel better or worse? Do you help them to do the right thing or the wrong thing? When you have been in, been in contact with someone, do they grow and mature and forgive? Or do they hold resentments and they say, yeah, I was wronged? See what I mean? There was a lot of things that um, I have had a lot of opportunity to become bitter about different things. And I've made it my practice to always forgive even if I think that um, they don't deserve it. And it's been my constant practice to always repent even if I don't think I did anything wrong. God, show me which way is, dis is displeasing to you and me. Because I know that somewhere in there, there's something in me that's not perfect, even if I can't see it. See what I mean? So if I'm praying for God to show, it, show me those things, then he will. And then I'll be able to work on it. See what I mean? But if I go to it with the idea that I'm right, and I don't need anybody else's input, well, I'm just setting myself up for disaster. Uh, another question, what effect does that person have on other people? So whoever you're hanging around with that person. What's the effect? When you've been around them, do you feel like you were just drained? Do you feel like kind of dirty? Um, do you feel like, see what I mean? Uh, when you're around uh, different people, and this can be people in the church or out of the church, just people who you're around and ask yourself these questions. What effect are they having on people? How, do, how can I tell that they've been there? There's been people that I can tell when they've been there because everybody's down. They're complaining about everything. I'm just like, that person must have been here. I, just, I can just tell everybody's a real down. And there's other people. You can tell when they're there. It's just like a light came on in the room. You know those kinds of people? And, uh, okay, another question. Um, do, do you or this other person, do they have any old friends? I found that the people who cause the biggest problems don't have old friends. And I mean old, close friends. I'm not talking about, yeah, I know them from 50 years ago, but do you really know each other? That's what I'm talking about. Because it says here, a gossip separates close friends. That means that the gossip has no close friends either. Gossips don't just separate other people's close friends. They themselves push close friends away. They sit around in little gossip groups talking about how, how this person is wrong, that person, and then eventually they irritate each other and they get, they, they get in fights all the time. Are, is a person in constant conflict or are they not? For, if for somebody to get in a conflict, you're, you're human. But when you're always in conflict with everybody you come in contact with, there's something wrong. Um, and that's my next question. Is there conflict, conflict surrounding them or you? Are they always in a conflict with someone, but, is, but it's always someone else's fault? Well, it was my fault this time. It was them because they did this. Um, when you're talking with this kind of person, it's going to feel real good. You talk about someone that you both hate. Everybody hates that person. Uh, but afterwards, it leaves you kind of feeling washed out, like you're spent. Uh, like Bilbo Baggins, butter that's been spread over too much bread. Uh, and so what are the consequences of, the, of being there with them? You know, what are the consequences of this? And that kind of gives you, uh, gives you the, the, I guess, the 411 on, on what's going down with the person. Uh, so then two more verses, I believe. Yeah, two more verses. Proverbs 17, 4, a wicked person listens to malicious talk, but a liar uh, pays attention to a destructive tongue. Have you ever had someone who spreads lies about you? I mean, just like constantly spreading lies. Have you ever heard that? I, I've had quite a few. The church's had quite a few. Dad's had quite a few. Uh, those who still believe the lies about a year later are the people who are just like them. See, sometimes somebody's going to spread lies, and you're going to find out who are really who really had your back and who doesn't. There are going to be some friends that you have that believe the lies, and then they're going to realize that they messed up, and they're going to say, look, I'm sorry. Then you're going to have other people who are a year later, they're still believing the lies. And that will show you whether they were actually your friend or not. Um, <clears throat> everyone gets taken in sometimes. Everybody gets taken in sometimes. You're not going to be perfect. Your friends aren't going to be perfect. Everybody's going to get taken in sometimes. But always getting taken in, and every time a bitter person comes by, that's not good. When every single time that there's, a, there's a problem person that comes by and that friend is always believing them and always going to them, that person is not a friend. It's not. You, you can keep giving them excuses, but it's not good. And I'll give you an example that happened here at the church. We had this, uh, we, we called it the Man Haters Club. 
it, it was really it was a really funny name that we had, and I thought it was funny. So I thought I'd be shared too. There was a man manhandage club, and the idea was that there was a group of women. There was about five or six of them, and every single one of them, super super disgruntled at men in general. They just hated men, and they were always saying these snide, snide comments to the men in the church, like always. And uh, most, I believe, all of them had been divorced at least once. And they just had this chip on their shoulder towards men. Men are jerks. They never do what's right. They're a waste of space. So on and so forth. Basically, it was like watching a Disney movie. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, so, do what? All the new movies. All the new movies. So watch the new Star Wars shows, the new Star Wars movies, the new MCU movies. Oh my gosh, it's like men are the most incapable, stupid things to have ever lived on planet Earth from the way they tell it. It's a good thing there's women around because they solve everything. Like you'll have, you'll have this guy that's like trying to put a triangle into a square hole and be like, I can't figure it out. And then the woman will come and be like, oh, no, no, silly. He's got to turn it. <laughs> it's, like, it's like super off the top. And then you have like this 90-pound woman who's taking out these monster guys. And I'm like, yeah, no. <laughs> Like not even bear mace would take that guy out, <laughs> but anyways, I'm getting off, I'm getting off track. Uh, I just think that it's funny. Yeah, I just meant it as a little side joke there. Um, and and every woman in the, in this group was disgruntled. And the thing is, it got me where I was starting to look at women like every woman is a man hater in in waiting. Eventually, this woman is going to become a man hater too because of six because of six foul tempered women. Okay. And it started rubbing off on me, and I was thinking, Ugh. with that being said, you can see how they got it. They've been in a nasty divorce or two, get around with other people who have that never healed from it. You can see how pain just kind of spreads. So I hope that that kind of helps you to cut them some slack in this story, okay? Um, and so then they would join forces and accuse the men of stuff that never happened. And it got very troublesome because they oftentimes they, they'd gang up on the pastor. Oh, you're a manipulator. You're a this, you're a that. And it's like, okay, and what specific examples do you have of this? And so it got, it got where it was like this constant annoyance. And um, keeping the peace wasn't really working too much. <laughs> it, nothing was really working. Um, and so th there were some people who, who listened every single time that each of these women, women came by. And uh, I know that if another person comes by, they're going to listen again because I've seen what's inside. And why am I telling you this story? So that you too can learn from my mistake. When somebody shows their true colors, it's their true colors, okay? There's a difference between a friend messing up because your friends sometimes are gonna believe a lie about you. It happens, but if they're still listening every single time, year after year, it's like, yeah, that's, that's not a friend. Um, and, you know, friendship has to be kind of based on a person's ability to talk with you. And if they're not, they're just believing lies. But probably not really a friend. So uh, I know that these people haven't learned. And obviously I'm willing to give them more tries, more chances, so on and so forth. I try to forgive them the best I can. But I'm also not going to be naive and stupid, right? Um, if your kid sneaks out and does drugs, and they say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not, not going to do it again. And they do it again the next night, and then the next night. And then, like, it's time to wisen up. They're, they're, they're just, you know, saying stuff at this point. So uh, what happened is this person who started listening to these every single time one of these bitter women came by, they turned into what, what we like to call in the office a union rep. You know what that is? <laughs> That's where somebody hears a story that they have no idea whether it's true, but it's true because they said it. And uh, then they take up that cause for the person, and then they come and talk to you about it. So even though they don't know what they're talking about, they have it on good authority to talk to you. And so your time as a leader gets taken up with these problems after problem, and you start to lose sight of what am I even here for? And you start to hate going to church. You start to hate talking to people. And like I said, you start to hate women a little bit too. You're like, all of y'all need to just go somewhere else. There's a Jehovah's Witness over there. Go over there. <laughs> and, you know, I'm just joking, just joking. But uh, it gets to be one of those things where it's, where it's a constant annoyance and it kind of wears you down. It's like kids. Having kids are great. But when your kids are going through a rough patch and it's like, <sighs> it gets a little old. You don't like coming home from work because you're like, I got to deal with it again. You sleep, you're the whole time you're trying to go to sleep, but you're too irritated to sleep. So you're just like, you can feel your heart 
And it's like, <laughs> anyways. Um, and so here, this, this, this was a funny little, and towards the end of it, um, one of them tried to accuse me of something, right? And uh, it was uh, about me being unfaithful. Okay. It was in front of a camera. <laughs> How, uh, I, I just, there's a camera right there. It recorded the whole thing. Suddenly, the claim just disappeared. How about that? <laughs> Anyways, so, it, you know, it worked out in the end. Yeah, but it did take me a while to get over the bad attitude. So I'm telling you so you guys can, you know, take care of your heart because it is the wellspring of the rest of your life. So uh, numerous times uh, I dealt with troubled people. And, and one thing you see time and time again, I like them so they couldn't be like that. Let's say, let's say uh, Lynette is, is a false teacher or something. She's coming in here. She's pretending to be everybody's friend. Everybody's like, oh, Lynette's the greatest thing in the world. So then I say, well, you know, um, Lynette's actually uh, a snake. She's been trying to do this, this, and this. Oh, well, that, that's, that's not true. It's like, why is that not true? Because I like Lynette. You see what I mean? That's one of the founding things that we do with their life. And people, you see people did this, <clears throat> did this with Jonestown. I said that, right? Did this with Jonestown, yeah, too, where people just kind of caught up, and I like him, or I like this, and I like that. And you stop kind of thinking because you like the person. And I, I do have to say, most false prophets and false teachers you guys are going to find out out there, they don't look like false prophets or false teachers. They look like regular people. And they're very charismatic. You like to like them. They're just like, oh, this is a nice person. Like, it's not going to be somebody you say, oh, he's evil. No, that's the whole idea of the wolf in sheep's clothing. Like, so not that you should be you know, uh, pessimistic towards everybody, but also you know, read the Bible. Read the Bible. Uh, so what are, what are they listening to? These people, you know, are, are, are they listening to false teachers themselves? Are they, are they listening to gossip? Um, I've known a lot of times where somebody came in and they looked like the perfect Christian. And then they come in and they find somebody who's disgruntled. They find them. And then they start talking with them. And then you see that the conflict grows and the bitterness grows. If somebody's really hearing from God, they're not going to say, oh, well, glory, and shake. Okay? People are going to be changed. When the Holy Spirit moves, people are going to forgive people that they've never forgive before. When the Holy Spirit moves, people will get saved who were not saved before. It's not rolling around like a dead fish on a deck. That's not, or not a dead fish, a fish out of water on a deck. That's what I meant to say. That's, that's, not, that's not what the Holy Spirit moving is. And you have a lot of weird stuff out there right now. Like, oh, there's gold dust falling from our, from our vents. That means God is here. I, I don't recall that ever being a sign of God being there. I don't ever recall the revival coming because of gold dust falling out of a vent. You know what I mean? So, one of those things. And uh, then there was, a, I can tell you another story, a really quick story, too. Uh, we had this board member, and uh, he, ooh, he was, he was quite a problem. He was quite a problem. And uh, I remember one person said, yeah, he's a problem, but, but his wife isn't. And I said, okay, um, I wouldn't say that yet because here's the thing. Um, Married people have a way of rubbing off on each other. And they have a way of going home and talking to each other. Now, I'm not saying that married people always agree on everything. I'm not saying that. But, yeah, and, and it would be wise until you know what the 411 is to maybe not share too much. Make sense? So, uh, and this isn't something that just applies to church problems. I tell you church problems because I've been I've lived, I've been in ministry for 17 years. I mean, I, I know a lot about church problems. I've handled a lot of church problems. But it applies to other things too. Uh, when you have your girlfriends that get around and they you know do the exact same thing. Uh, when you have work friends that do the exact same thing, you know it, it's not just in the church. A wicked person listens to malicious talk, and a liar pays attention to a destructive tongue. This will help you know where you're at. It'll help you know where, where other people are at. And pay attention to these signs. Pay attention. So uh, Matt, Jesus actually said, you will know them by their fruit. And Jesus told us to judge wisely. And Paul told us, hey, you shouldn't be judging the world, but you should definitely be judging one another. So if the Bible tells us that many times to judge, 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 don't think that just because one verse says, hey, don't judge until you've pulled the plank out of your eye, don't think that that means you shouldn't judge at all. You shouldn't be judgmental. You shouldn't be a jerk. That'd be another way of saying that. Yeah, absolutely. But you should have discernment. You should have discernment. Do I have signs that I'm growing? Does this person have signs that they're growing? Is this person a bad influence on me? 
lot of times, you know, we don't ask these kinds of questions. So Proverbs 17, 13, the last verse we're going to look at tonight. If anyone returns evil for good, evil will never depart from his house. Now, there's different kinds of repayment. There's when you do good to somebody and they, they, they repay you with evil. They, you, you, you maybe open up your home to them and they shot back at you. This is something that's punished by God. Then there's people who you did bad to them and they did bad to you. That's not punished by God. That's just kind of like, you kind of just get what you sow there. Then there's people who, who um, they do good to you and then you do good to them. Now, this is what the Pharisees did back when Jesus was alive. He said, hey, this is exactly the thing. And there's no credit in there for you. There's no credit to repay good to somebody who was good to you. Like, oh, Damien was nice to me, so I was nice to him. Well, good for you. That doesn't mean anything. Like, anyways, uh, so I know this guy actually really well, and he took this girl in um, as family. She she had a very very troubled past. Her her father was uh, molested her repeatedly and then killed himself. Uh, it was just a very messy situation. And so he opened up his home to this girl, and uh, so she moved in, and uh, nothing unseemly or anything happened. Uh, but he was always there for her like a father in the place of the father that she lost. And uh, he helped her in, in everything. And um, she ended up marrying this guy's son. And, uh, you know, fast forward 10 or so years, um, some things happened. And so she cheated on the son and um, lied to the father to get him to give her a loan. And um, so she turned around and started spreading lies and, and, and started telling people that this guy worked with all kinds of things that weren't true, where he was running into random people in the, in, in, the, in, in the city that he lived that he had known before. And they said, and they were treating him different and, and giving them cold shoulder about stuff that he didn't even do. That would be a good example where, some, where he did nothing but good to this person and she turned around and did nothing but evil towards him. And when that happens, this is there's some things that God takes very, very, very seriously. If you mistreat a widow or an orphan, God takes that personal. It's not something that he just like, oh, it's just another sin. I don't know who told you that all sins are equal. That's stupid. Not all sins are equal. All sins equally separate us from God, but not all sins are equal. If you mistreat a child, it's better than if you have a millstone cast around your neck and be thrown into the sea. That's not the truth for every single sin that you commit. In the law, there's a lot of sins that he says, this is worthy of death. But he doesn't say that about every single sin, does he? So, you know, there, there's, there's, there's some things that God just takes really seriously. And when somebody does good and you repay them with evil, God takes that very personally. It says here that evil will not depart from his house. God literally makes sure that things do not go well for you in the future. Think about that. God himself, the creator, is personally has a vendetta against you. So think about this. Next time you want to get even with somebody, don't repay evil for the good that's been done for you. Don't let your heart go there. It'll ruin you. It'll ruin your kids. It'll ruin your household. You'll start having problems where you didn't have them before. Your, your, your marriage will have conflict. Just don't do it. Just, just don't. It might make you feel good for a second to get the one up on them and you showed them. It's not worth it. The price you pay in the end is not worth it. Um, so what is evil? Evil can be lots of different things. Uh, sometimes it's, it's a restless feeling inside. You just, I, 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 don't, I don't belong here. I need to be at this place. And so you, you move around trying to find what, what's, what's wrong, and you just always have this feeling of being unsettled. Um, sometimes it, you just stop hearing God, like you're praying, and it just sounds like you're talking against a wall. And I'm not saying you can never find repentance for these kinds of things. You can never find forgiveness. That's not what I'm saying. But sometimes God kind of lets you wallow in the mud for a little bit before he washes you off. And it's not pleasant. Very much are not, not pleasant. Um, sometimes the evil that comes on you is bad things happening like a curse. It's like every time you turn around, there's something else going wrong. Your tire goes flat when it's like, I just got this tire. So you, you go and you get a, get a replace, another tire goes flat. It's like, okay, this isn't that big of a deal. So then you have an oil leak on your car. It's like, why is this stuff happening? You go to work, you start having a conflict, or people start spreading lies. It's like, why is this happening? Now, bad things happen to everybody, but... When you do th certain things, God kind of goes out of his way to bring you to a place of repentance. And when you are in a place where you are returning evil to somebody who did good, God's pretty quick. I mean, he, he's merciful and all that, but he will get on you, and it will not be pleasant. And you will eventually humble yourself or die in your arrogant pride, and you will not be happy either way. Save yourself the misery. 
Um, sometimes it's in the form of having problems with kids. I know a lot of, I, I've known uh, a couple different people who did these, I don't really want to go into details, but they did these really jacked up things. And um, after they had done them, they started having conflict with their kids and their kids left the faith and all these different things. Surprise, surprise, when we're not humble and submitted to God, our kids won't be. I don't know why that gets people, all, 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 you know, surprises them, but it's it's true. If you don't make church a priority, your kids don't. Um, I mean, I mean, obviously you guys are all here. I'm talking about people who come like once or twice a year and they're like, oh, you know, my kids don't take God seriously. Well, I wonder why. You know, it's not something that... Yeah. Right, exactly. And so there's a principle here. You disobey the laws of the land, then you expect your kids to obey you. That's, that's, that's not how things work. So I hope that you guys kind of get what I'm saying here with this one. And you have any questions? No? We have one, one more week of Proverbs next week, and then you never have to hear me talk about Proverbs ever again. So, last week I had... If you don't laugh about it, you're going to cry about it. Uh, you know, if you ever get too sad, if you ever get too sad, just remember how dry and long and boring my lessons were, and then it'll be fine. You'll be like, ah, oh, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> so, uh, l last week I had a... F <laughs> Do I? It's on YouTube. You can watch it, or not. Uh, uh, but, okay, so last week I had a funny a funny b um, slide about fantasy. This time I thought I'd do a funny one as well. <sighs> Go on now. Yeah, get. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I make myself laugh. <laughs> I'm that guy that sits in my room crying all day, and I'm like, <laughs> get on, get. <laughs> oh.